Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Open Democracy's live discussion. I'm just going to give everybody a moment or two to filter in, and then we will get cracking with the with, with the, today's really interesting topic. And Peter promised us he was going to sing. <laughs> That's so mean. <laughs> I, I, do you know, we could do a rendition of Flower of Scotland, given it's a Scottish <laughs> I, um, I once was made, because I don't have a Scottish accent, I was once made to prove that I was Scottish in... Um, a bar on the Falls Road before anyone would talk to me by singing it. And when I had done, they then all told me all their old stories from their days in the IRA, but only once I could prove I knew all the words. I have, I do not have uh, a similar Flower of Scotland story, for, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you. Um, so yeah, so thank you everybody for, uh, for coming along to uh, today's discussion on a kind of a similar, a, a, a quite a weighty topic, is Britain breaking up? Um, a famous title, which in some ways speaks to Tom Nairn's famous book, The Breakup of Britain, which has uh, been reissued with a new preface, I think, by Anthony Barnish, who's just uh, popped up uh, it was saying, hi there, Flower of Scotland. So, you know, in many ways, this is a conversation that's been going on for quite a while. It's in many ways not a completely new conversation, but, well, yes, exactly. So Adam's displaying this new version of uh, Tom Nairn's seminal, The Breakup of Britain. But in many ways, it's not a new conversation, The Breakup of Britain, but it, I think it's particularly resonant. This is a week which is the centenary of the foundation of Northern Ireland, which, you know, in many ways is... is a contentious moment and a moment that speaks to kind of issues around the union itself. But also um, this is the day in which there's elections across Britain, not, not Northern Ireland, but in Wales and Scotland, the devolved assemblies are having elections and also there's elections across England uh, for lots of, for everything from metro mayors to um, local councils and Hartlepool is having a by-election as well. So there's lots of questions and a lot of questions about, well, what does what does this all mean for the future of the United Kingdom? And I'm, these are kind of some of the things we're going to try and explore today. But before we get to delving into, you know, is a second referendum in Scotland on the cards? What does it, what's the future of unionism like in Northern Ireland? And, and all these other issues. I'm going to put all of my, I'm going to introduce all of my guests and then put them on the spot. So uh, I'm delighted to be joined here today by Sarah Crichton, who's a writer and lawyer who's coming to us from Belfast. We have Matthew O'Toole, who's an SDLP MLA for South Belfast. We have Adam Ramsey, who's Open Democracy's main site editor and is coming to us from Portobello, outside of Edinburgh. And we have Richard Wynne-Jones, Professor of Welsh Politics. I haven't checked, Richard, but I'm assuming you're in Cardiff. At the I'm moment. back in Cardiff. You're yeah. back in Cardiff. I took a big guess there, but at least it paid off. So I'm going to give, I would like to go around the room before we get into some of these topics to kind of, you know, the day that's in it, what do we, what's our thoughts on today's elections? What are the things that are standing out for us? Richard, uh, seems I started with you and you're in Wales and Wales is a place I'm always interested in finding out more about. What's what's been striking you with this election in in Wales or wherever else you think is interesting? Well, from you know, um, I'm going to make a startling prediction that as Labour is going to be the largest party in the election in Wales, um, it's been you, you spoke about the centenary of Northern Ireland. So next year is the centenary of Labour's um, kind of complete electoral dominance in Wales. They've been, they've been the largest party in every important election, bar a couple of European elections, which I'm not going to talk about, since 1922. And they are going to be the largest party uh, after today. And for me, I mean, this it kind of reinforces something that we've known about since 2015, but it's, I, still, I still think we haven't thought it through properly, which is we now have three different dominant parties in the three... Uh, nations of Britain. I'll leave Northern Ireland out of it for a moment. Um, and uh, you know, English Tory hegemony seems unshakable. Uh, the SNP are going to turn in another absolutely stonking performance in Scotland. Labour are going to win again in Wales. And from 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 the dominant party perspective here in Wales, this is a huge problem, right? Because what is the Welsh Labour project? They, they look to Scotland, they're trying to avoid some of the mistakes that they think that the Scottish Labour has, has made. So don't alienate your independence voting supporters, lesson one from Scotland. They look, they look at England and they go, oh my gosh, how are they ever going to come back from there? And then they're here, they're, which they're doing very well. But, you know, their project, which is essentially a home rule project, appears to be undermined by a muscular unionism, so-called in Westminster. 
and White Tone, where do they go? What do they do? And, you know, they're going to do well today, but the, the strategic dilemma they face gets ever more intense. Thanks for that, Richard. That's something, and this idea of muscular unionism and this tension between unionists across, uh, across, we want to call them these islands, is something I really think we, I, I'm looking forward to kind of delving into more as we, as we go on as well. And just to let everybody know as well, I forgot to say at the, at the start, I often do with these things, that we're really keen to get people involved as well. So, you know, thanks everybody who submitted questions ahead of time and comments, and we're going to be coming to them as we go. But also, if you're joining us on the Zoom, you know, please put your comments into the chat box uh, and we can try and get to them. And similarly, if you're on Facebook, put your questions to the comments and we'll try and raise them too. So we will be lots of time to chat. Um, I'm going to come now, I think now, I'm going to come now to Sarah in Belfast. Um, I know Belf uh, Northern Ireland doesn't have any elections, but it's fair to say it's not been short of politics this week or any other week, uh, you know, between a DUP election, the centenary storm, and the, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. So Sarah, what, what's, you know, what's some of your reflections on this week? Um, it's it's been a lot, hasn't it? You know, um, you know, I was I, I got the COVID vaccine the other day and was sick <laughs> for a couple of days, and then, you know, all this has been going on in the background, um, on top of everything. You know, it's it's been a real eventful week. Um, obviously, it kicked off with with the news that Arling Foster was going to step down, and um, which was coming a while. I think you know we were told she's safe. No, she's not. She's safe. No, she's not. But they moved against her. And I think they had to move quick because if they want to put somebody in, they have to get her in before the election. Um, and that happening kind of a couple of days away from the Northern Ireland centenary, I think, was was it was quite brutal, really, for Arling Foster. Um, but it has really brought about um, a whole question now about unionism within Northern Ireland, which has always really, I think, been kind of separate in some ways um, from unionism across Britain. Um, and I think really the DUP now are facing this choice between Edwin Poots and Jeffrey Donaldson. And there's a question really about what direction they're going to take. And, you know, DUP don't define unionism in Northern Ireland, but they are the largest party and therefore they are the leaders really of political unionism. So it's going to have a real impact. And I think no matter what type of unionist you are in Northern Ireland, everybody is, is depending on what view you take on these things, everybody's looking to see who they're going to pick, um, you know, somebody from the more progressive wing of unionism you know obviously you know I'm not expecting the DUP to pick somebody who I would like I think you have to go outside the DUP to do that but that is the real question at the moment um but you know reflecting on the, the you know the, the the elections at the moment obviously for me who is a unionist you know obviously Scotland's a big concern you know the SNP are expected to do very well it's probably going to drive them towards asking for a second independence referendum which you know I, I don't want Scotland to leave but I mean I believe in the people in Westminster really for bringing us to this point um Wales, you know, um, I, I suppose I'm interested because, I, you know, from what I have read, there has been talk that there has been maybe some more independent sentiment in Wales. And I do wonder, would that show in any type of small way in the election? You know, could Pai Cymru maybe, you know, put gains on that? You know, I know during COVID there was, um, there was a bit of talk about that, but I don't know how real that is. And obviously within England, you know, that the Tories are, are a huge problem really for unionism within the regions. You know, I think we could probably deal with a lot of problems right now if the Tories were not there. Um, so I'm, I'm keen to see what what happens in, in England as well. Um, so I think it's a really important time for unionism at this point in time. I think it's a very difficult time for unionism um, to a certain degree. So I guess that's kind of where I'm at at the moment, really. I'm kind of interested to see what comes from tomorrow when no doubt we'll, we'll have another million of conversations to talk about union um, after we get the results in. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Matthew, I was really struck during, like, like during the week and in the last kind of week or so when our, the move against Arlene Foster came. And, I, you know, it's fair to say it wasn't just around social policies. There was a lot of anger, it seems, in the DUP about lots of other things, including the party's Brexit position. And, and just a sense, I think, that Arlene Foster had, flip-flopped a hell of a lot and they weren't really sure what she was doing it, some, it anymore you know you had somebody who at the start of January was selling the benefits of the protocol and by March was a signatory in a legal challenge to the protocol's very existence which suggests beyond just the levels of normal political uh, political kind of flexibility but one thing that did strike me you know that she she uh, Arlie Foster kind of was forced out really just after abstaining on a, a a vote on a ban on gay conversion therapy that was put forward by the Ulster Unionists. Mm. And so you could kind of see it within the context of, of social conservatism in the DUP. And there's been a lot of talk, does the, does the DUP move more to the right? Does it try and it kind of kind of have a pincer movement against to stop voters hiving off like further to its right from the traditional unionist voice? 
and it kind of when there's been a lot of conversation once it suggests like is Northern Ireland going backwards and that in a kind of way in terms of politics but what struck me is really interesting um you're from the SDLP of course but also with the Alliance Party, the Green Party, in some ways it feels like Northern Ireland in a way that really wasn't the case before over the last, say, 10 years, is now a, a three, you know, without be, we're putting people in the boxes, but like a three-thirds society. You have people who are solidly on in the in the unionist camp. You have people who are solidly in the kind of Republican, you know, green t- greener version of nationalist camp. But you also have an increasing number of people for whom, you know, this this polity, you know, there's a, there's a kind of, the sense in which that's not the politics that they necessarily want to see. And I'm just wondering, by fixating so much on the internal machinations of the DUP and things like gay conversion therapy, are we missing some of the deeper changes that are happening in Northern Ireland? Well, I think the two are connected. Um, uh, to be honest, you are right that Northern Ireland is now more complex than simply uh, unionist and nationalist. I think what that means um, for people who do have a constitutional preference, and obviously my party does, is that um, to the extent that you want to further promulgate that cause, you need to advance your constitutional position grounded in a way that speaks to people's, uh, to other aspirations other than a constitutional belief or a sense of, um, you know, identity, tribal or otherwise. Um, certainly that's what we're doing. We've launched a commission today, not that I'm doing plugs for my party, but, um, you know, so I think from our perspective, we are a social democratic party. Part of our identity is that we are a center-left social democratic party and part of our identity is that we aspire to constitutional change the challenge for us is putting putting the two of them together and explaining how one um helps deliver on the other but that's not what we're all about we're not a uh, unlike other parties a solely constitutional party to go back to the question you asked me peter about um the dup um and why i think the the the, you know the emergent third in the middle um, some of whom do have a constitutional preference, by the way, I think that uh, adds to the complexity of Northern Ireland and sometimes in a set people sometimes talk about the Ulsterization of Scottish politics or the Ulsterization of politics in um, Britain, GB generally, and that's definitely true, but of course the, the corollary to that is that we're a lot further on in that journey we've been doing that we, we're really we're really experienced at it, we've been doing it now for literally centuries, so you know you won't, you won't get better than us at it. Um, uh, but it does mean that th- that group in the middle, they're not, it's not that they don't all have a constitutional preference, it's that they don't, uh, they don't want the politics and public life to be solely defined by it. But the, why I think it's connected to, to the crisis you're seeing within the DUP is that the dominance that you saw within the DUP was uh, really contingent on a number of um, uh, sort of factors that were um, specific to the time when they became dominant, which was in the middle 2000s, they managed to gazump the Ulster Union, the more kind of uh, moderate, slightly more staid unionist party, uh, they did. They were they moved from the extremes. They did a deal with Sinn Féin. They then became a coalition of their old Paisleyite fundamentalist, socially conservative wing, kind of working class loyalism, which consolidated around them, particularly as some of the more, I guess, more you know, um, working class loyalist parties died away. Um, and that coalition joined up with a kind of pragmatic, fairly pro-business kind of right-leaning uh, unionist establishment. Now, Brexit is the thing which has undermined all of that. The protocol is one symptom of it, but really Brexit had started to undermine it even in 2016 when the DUP, DUP kind of put itself in tension with lots of the business lobby groups that were very friendly with the DUP for a number of years uh, in the kind of McGuinness uh, Peter Robinson's duopoly years, um, they put themselves ag- against those interest groups. And that meant that once the dust settled, the post-Brexit dust settled, we know lots of the constitutional cards have been thrown in the air. We're talking about that today, but also loads of other is- questions have been thrown into the air, including the future of Northern Ireland's economy and lots of other things. And so the coalition that the DUP had in that period that Arlene Foster really represented, because obviously she came from the UP, it's difficult to put that back together. So I think that's a lot of what you're seeing as well, is that a, co- a coalition that existed um, is no longer uh, possible. It's, a, it's an electoral coalition, but also a coalition of interest. And um, and it doesn't quite exist in the way that it did before. And that's a big challenge for the DEP. It's also a challenge for unionism, but it's particularly a challenge for the DEP. Thank you very much for that, Matthew. I'm going to come now, uh, finally, to fi- last but not least, to, um, to Adam Ramsey, you know, kind of, you're, you're like myself, Adam, you're currently in Scotland. Um, 
what's been your you know like where do you think we're going in this journey like you know do you think this is going to be an election that it's been framed i'm very struck i think we have a tendency to frame elections as huge political moments when often politics happens outside of elections but i guess you could make an argument in this case that because so much is a, con a constitutional conversation in scotland and the smp you know an smp majority has been set up as the test whether that's a re is that a reasonable test for a second referendum maybe that a fair question you know does, in a multi-party uh, system does make does does expecting one party to end up with a majority I, I, you know is that is that a reasonable um, test for whether there's a democratic mandate for a second independence referendum well, i suppose i mean the test and i think that there was a poll which bore this out the test that most people in scotland um have is whether a majority of msps come from pro-independence parties which primarily means the SNP and the Greens. But I mean, for me, to answer the broader question, there are two things you can say about this election in Scotland, which are kind of contradictory and also both true. One is that it's possibly the most important Scottish Parliament election ever. Um, it's likely that there will be, I think, a mandate for another independence referendum. And then how that plays out is anyone's guess, but it's certainly going to be a dramatic event. The other is that it's been really boring. Like, we all kind of know what's going to happen. Um, there's... You know, COVID means there's no doorstep campaigning. We all knew what everyone was going to say in advance, and they said it. There are some questions, you know, how many Greens will there be exactly? Will Labour or the Tories be the second biggest party? But we all know Nicola Sturgeon is going to be the first minister after the election. And I, like, it would be very surprising if the SNP and Greens together didn't have a majority. You know, maybe the SNP will get one on their own, maybe they won't, but that's sort of academic. And so... I think we can believe both those things, it's both very important, but also because it's kind of pretty foregone conclusion, it's not the great high political drama it often is. What we're really seeing is the continued unfolding of the same political trends as we've seen for a decade in Scotland and, and you know, 15 years really, um, which, you know, we can talk through at length um, over the next hour or so, but, but I don't propose to do so now. Sure. Well, let me move on then uh, to the kind of, I guess to this wider question, you know, is, you know, like the, the breakup of Britain, which I think is a reasonable question. I'm often struck now polls in Scotland, for example, are pretty much 50-50 most polls. And if a poll is below 50, it's kind of celebrated as, you know, defeat, you know, a bad sign for independent supporters. If a poll is over 50, it's, you know, bad sign for the union. But I'm really struck that if you fast forwarded to this day 10 years ago, almost exactly this day 10 years ago, before the 2011 Holyrood election, which was the SNP went into the election as a minority government. Um, at the time, I was living in Edinburgh and I was really struck. I used to play, I, used to play, I took up cricket in my 20s because uh, I, I, I was a freelance journalist and I found I, I didn't really meet very many people. I'd always wanted to play cricket. And growing up in Longford, that wasn't an option. So I took up cricket and um, I, I really enjoyed it. It was great. I have loads of great friends from it. But I remember being there, uh, playing a Sunday game just a Sunday before the election and lots of the team were English and a lot of them were kind of from the north of England had come to work in Edinburgh um, and I remember asking them, how are you voting guys and almost to a man they're all voting for the SNP and I said that's really interesting and at this stage independence wasn't a question but the SNP went on famously to win uh, a majority on actually on 45 percent of the vote and so independence became firmly onto the political radar but if you'd said 10 years ago that you would have a series of polls that said that Scotland was completely divided on the question of independence, I don't think anyone would have believed you. And I think we can lose sight of the, the big changes that have happened relatively quickly because we tend to fixate on short term cephalogical moments, you know, a poll this week or a poll that week, which does bring me to the kind of question of like, are we at this point where we do need to fundamentally talk about the big C word, the British constitution and constitutional change? And, and if I'm to, does anybody on the, if, if anybody in the panel thinks that we don't need to please say that too, but I'm just kind of wondering is, does the current status quo, is it sustainable? And, and you know, if it isn't, what should we be looking at? I might start with you, Richard, because you've recently written a book on Englishness. And I think I'm aware that there's not an English voice on this panel, Oh, yeah, that's well, having done a, book, a lot of book tours recently, I'm, I'm well aware of how important this is uh, in all good bookstores. It, 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 an honourable mention for your co-author, Ailsa Henderson, as well, who, who any viewers in Scotland will see, I think, a lot over the next uh, 72 hours. But yeah, I just, you know, Englishness as well feels like a, an important part of this conversation, too. So just, yeah, what, what do you what's what's your take? So I think, you know, uh, that there is there are so many different facets in what you've just been saying there, Peter, and just pick up on a couple of them. So, I, I, I mean, there are, um, Ilse and I have been working on Englishness. We've also been doing cross 
uh, four territory surveys um, comparing attitudes. Um, most of the survey work that happens is about your own place and about your relationship with England, essentially. So nobody ever asks anybody in Northern Ireland, what do you think about Wales? Or, or you know, and, and so on and so forth. So Ilse and I have been digging into the weeds. We've also written this big book about Englishness. And I mean, there are several takeaways from this. First of all, uh, there's a tendency um, to view what's going on as where well, you've got kind of nationalism and competing unionisms on the periphery. And this, this, the core of the state is somehow kind of watching on beatifically. And of course, this is an absolute nonsense. And what the, the most consequential constitution, constitutional change that this state has seen for at least a century, I would say, is, is the, the Brexit project. And what we know about that is in England, it's very much attached to English national identity. Those people who feel um, most um, hostile to the European project are also deeply uh, unhappy about England's position within the domestic union, think that England gets a bad deal. I mean, some of this, as a Welsh-speaking Welshman whose language, whose language got equal status in the UK in 2011, I'm kind of thinking, well, mm, this, this, you know, this, this, this oppression that you're suffering, England. I'm not quite sure about this, but anyway, it is nonetheless a fact that you have this, these very deeply felt. I'm, I am making light of it, but these are very deeply felt sentiments, and they are moving the dial. The Conservative Party mobilized this sentiment very deliberately in the 2015 general election, won that election. As a consequence of that victory, we got the Brexit referendum. We know that result. So what we have is a state where, and what's interesting about that particular dimension is that uh, on every occasion when people have warned, if you go down a certain route, it will damage the domestic union, people have gone down that route anyway. I mean, the, the classic example here is Boris Johnson. Think of those two articles that he wrote where apparently he was trying to decide who to support. In, if you read the, the, the draft, let's re vote remain article, he specifically says, if, if we leave, there's a problem with Scotland. Did it stop him? Of course not. You know, time and again, they choose the routes which damages the union. And then... Oh, pull clutching, things aren't going well in the union. So, you know, so, and, and that actually speaks to something profoundly interesting in the data that we get from the four territories, which is that nowhere, and we, we have another article, for those of you with an academic bent, Ilse and I have just published a piece called Unions of the Mind, which looks at the UK as a subjective state, okay? And what you find is in, is, that nowhere in the states do you find a majority for kind of down the line unionism. So that is the, the most important value, okay? What we find is that in all parts, there's a majority comprised of those people who want their territory to go anyway, or those people who say, well, um, you know, I don't want it to happen, but if somebody goes, fine, which is a kind of ambiguous, attitude. In, in all places, those people form a majority, okay? So, in combination. So, this is a state with very few partisans, basically. And, uh, and from a Welsh perspective, you know, Wales is basically Montenegro to the UK's Yugoslavia, if you like, okay? So, basically, we're the place who would be, you know, would be quite happy with home rule all round, if you like, okay? extensive devolution, find a way of making that work as a state. That, that's the sweet spot for Wales. But, you know, increasingly it appears that that's not a sweet spot that's attainable, which is why you get to Montenegro as the... Because the, the, the political conversations I hear constantly are, well, you know, if Scotland goes, there's an assumption, and actually there's not much interest in Northern Ireland. That's another common factor in the rest of the states. But the assumption is if Scotland goes, Northern Ireland will somehow, by some process which has never quite worked out, will somehow disappear into, the, into some all island. So that leaves Wales and England. 
the Kingdom of England and Wales. It's even got an acronym, Q, okay? And Q is not very attractive as a proposition. Psychologically, Q feels very awkward. And what you're seeing um, is two responses. One is um, independence, and we can come back to that, Sarah raised, you know, there is increasing, there's a kind of uh, grassroots independence campaign in Wales, which has been very impressive over the last couple of years. But that's matched by a kind of assimilationist, let's get rid of devolution, let's assimilate Wales fully into England in the way that it was for a period in the 19th century. And so we're seeing that, and this is Montenegro, so it's, this is the tension, where do you go? You, you prefer not to go anywhere, frankly, but it's a, cho a choice that's being forced upon you by the actions of others who you who take no notice of what you say. It's interesting. I was really struck a, a, a few years ago, actually, the Political Studies Association event in Cardiff. I'm sure you are too. Um, it was the form Carwin Jones, the former uh, Welsh First Minister, gave a, a, a lecture, former Labour First Minister of Wales, gave a speech that was incredibly nationalist and far more. It was before the Scottish referendum. And it was far more nationalist I'd ever heard a Scottish Labour leader give a speech. And it really, I thought it was, it was really interesting because it seemed, and I, I even when I've heard Mark Drakeford speak, he's not quite as bombastic as Carwin in many respects. He's slightly more downplayed. But there is a similar sense that that's, it feels as where some of Labour's, Scottish, uh, Welsh Labour's success has been, has been in remembering it. I mean, maybe there's a case, I'm, I'm you know, I'm just about to start Michael Keating's new book on, on the history of the, on, on unionism. And his thesis really is, is that the union has started, the union's degraded because it's been replaced from, it's no longer kind of regional specific unionism, and it's become this kind of British nationalism from a central state, this kind of muscular British nationalism, which I think the Conservative Party, having previously, in previous decades in Scotland, in the 50s, the Conservative Party were the biggest party in Scotland, and had a very Scottish side to them. They were Scottish unionists, and with a, you know, with a capital S, and in some ways a, a small U. And I think it's really interesting to see the disappearance of that. And the Scottish election has really shown that up in some respects, I think. The Conservative Party in Scotland has been left without knowing what it's supposed to say, because anything it says then becomes kind of counterpoise of what they're saying in, in England, what the national government is saying. And there's no sense of a, a potential for, for distinctiveness and I, I do wonder if there's a it feels as well within the kind of British commentator class particularly the kind of right-wing newspaper commentator class there's a rise of muscular nationalism without anyone really talking about it the idea is that devolution was a bit of a bad idea it was Tony Blair's idea as opposed to like freedom of information another pet subject of mine it becomes Blair's idea as opposed to the fact that leaving aside Wales Scottish devolution was the product of a very very long history within the Labour that Party was, you know was. and I, you know, and so the idea that Tony Blair just came to office and decided, you know what, I'm just going to do this thing is just completely for the birds. Northern Ireland's distinctiveness, I think, uh, there's an interesting paper, well, it looks like an interesting paper, I haven't read it yet, out of the House of Commons Library this week as well on the centenary of Northern Ireland, talking about Northern Ireland as the first experience of devolution that we don't talk about. You know, the devolution that took place in Northern Ireland a, a century ago, almost uh, to this day. And I kind of want to bring Sarah in now to kind of, talk a little bit about some of this because I was just thinking when Richard was talking about there about Brexit and you know and Englishness but it does feel as well the other thing you know Northern Ireland voted to remain of course but unionism and, and loyalism were very closely a lot I think in the Brexit process if you look at what we you know polls aren't exact but it does look like you know the polls did come down to a, a kind of green and orange split in many respects when it came to the, the Brexit referendum vote with very very high remain votes in nationalist areas like Derry was the highest vote in the country and quite high leave votes in 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 um in, in more unionist areas and you know how does from Belfast does that characterization from Richard of, of of Brexit really starting to pull these fissures of the union in really really discordant directions ring true at all? Um, it does, um, because I, th I think, as Richard says, it was very much an English project, but I, that's not, I, I think, though, the other mistake is not to discount the strength of feeling in Northern Ireland. I mean, that the, the Brexit vote here was was the sizable, you know, it was over 40%, it was about 40%, you know, high 30s or so. I think it was know. even higher. It was, yeah, I think, it was about 44. I think it was 55, 45, roughly. Yeah, you know, it was, so it was, it was a was, large vote. It was pretty decent, you know, and, you know, my, my dad voted leave and my brother voted leave, I voted remain. Um, for part of the reason because I didn't want to united Ireland um, but it is and I think it's really the, the, the direction of Brexit that they took and you know people voted Brexit for different reasons um, 
you know, my dad's a bit of a socialist, so he's never liked the European Union. You know, um, my, my brother told me we were going to get Norway and I said, my where's Norway? <laughs> um, you know, so it, it is, I think it was very much the direction they took really where the, the, the remain votes and the strength of feeling within the regions was not recognised or listened to. And in taking that Brexit where they didn't take that into consideration then has, I think, has caused this fracture and this this conflict now. So, you know, the, the, the large remain vote in Northern Ireland was completely ignored until Theresa May suddenly realised that, oh dear, this is actually going to cause a problem. The strength of feeling in Scotland was ignored as well. And it's basically just because, you know, I think it's because of the, the people who were driving up were English nationalists have never had to really think about the union that very much. I think they've always taken it for granted. Um, I think some unionists in Northern Ireland have done that as well, but I think we have always thought about the union, you know, in general terms, because we, we're so connected to it and it's, we're so, it's so hinged in our identity. And it really has, I think, you know, in ignoring... I think just the Brexit vote itself, just ignoring the fact that the Remain vote was also so high as well. You know, if it had been the other way around, Remainers would have been told, you have to listen to these Brexiteers and, and their concerns, which would have been absolutely right. But that just was not done. And I think in choosing that the Brexit that they did, which was the ha hard Brexit, instead of picking a, a softer one, um, that really did cause significant problems um, and a lot of anger. Um, and I think the attitude of, you know, you've lost, get over it, I think drove a lot of people away. Um, and in Northern Ireland, I think what you're seeing is, I suppose but we need to be clear about this. I mean, the polls in Northern Ireland, there's only really one poll that shows a, a, a strong move towards the United Ireland. Other polls are uncertain. Um, some polls show support for United Ireland as low as about 20, 30%. Others show slightly higher than that. I think what we can take for granted is that people are thinking about these things. Um, I think Brexit has had a factor with that. You know, a friend of mine, she described it as being like a jolt in her sleep where she said you know I'd never really thought about the type of country that I wanted before I'd never thought about what type of Northern Ireland I wanted and now now I'm thinking about it and I think particularly for the younger generation you know for my parents generation you know when United Ireland was what the provisional IRA wanted you know that that is that conflict is not the truth the violence isn't there anymore so people are coming to this from a, a very different perspective and they're weighing it up and you know I think Brexit has driven people to, to, to think, I would say, you know, I describe it as like a holding pattern. I think a lot of people right now are wanting to see what's going to happen. They want to know what, what's going to happen coming down the road. But um, I thought Richard's comments about English nationalism were, were really, really interesting, particularly about that, that sense that England hasn't really benefited from the union, you know, again, from the regions, that just seems incredible. Um, you know, the thing that always, I think, I suppose, is a bugbear of mine, um, you know, this attitude that no one really thinks about Northern Ireland. I mean, we know that over here. Everybody knows that. Unionists know that. Loyalists know that. But, I mean, there is this attitude, I think, um, with Northern Ireland that we kind of followed England home one day like a stray cat, you know, that we just kind of appeared suddenly, you know, as opposed to Northern Ireland being something that was constructed by Britain and, and you know, that was there and, um, you know, the discussion about English, British nationalism, of course, is very important, is very interesting as well, because, you know, over here, we've always, the Union flag has always flown on every street corner, you know, but I always find it quite strange when people in Britain get a bit uneasy about it, because, I mean, obviously, it's, it's an issue here as well, that's not to say that it's not, but, you know, British identity here has always been very strong, you know, I do have a, a British identity, I've always had, along with an Irish one and a, and a Northern Irish one, and I suppose, you know, I often wonder, you know, do, does, do people in Britain not ever wonder where that came from, did they not ever wonder where, Unionists and Lloydists got this from? Did they, you know, you know, it, it's, it's, we didn't just follow you home one day, you know, um, it, it comes from a long history over here. And I suppose it's interesting to see that debate about British nationalism. And I, I think Unionists in Northern Ireland have always got that to go back to, you know, that, that, that sense of Britishness, where I think in Britain, as you were saying, you know, the, that, that seems to have been lost somehow. And, and now it's been, it's been um, taken upon by the Tories in this very, brutal aggressive way and you know that they don't really understand the regions you can tell from what they're doing that they don't understand unionists in Scotland or Northern Ireland or Wales you know that they just they're just pushing ahead with this this idea you know, we'll stick a flag at the top of a building we'll, we'll do this and you know it's not really going to to help their cause and and I think it shows that they've basically just discovered the union you know I think they've just realized and they've gone oh no this is an issue now so I think um gone on a tangent here but yeah, it's it, it's I think Brexit certainly I think has has caused the difficulty, and I think it's particularly in Northern Ireland. I think um, for unionists, you know, the, I think Brexit it, it's a difficult one because you have to, as I say, you have to weigh up these two sides of being in Brexit. You can't just ignore the Brexiteers because they, they feel it very very strongly. But I think the solution I think could have been could have been a compromise at the start. I think some Remainers would have been willing to do that. I think they were pushed in a much more hardline direction, I think, and same with Brexiteers as well. So, yeah.
Just to pick up something you said there, I thought was very interesting. This idea that like they don't understand the thing of Northern Ireland is something that followed them home. You know, one day in England they disappeared. I was really struck because you know yeah. I am also quite sad. In the morning, I listen to a lot of different radio. Uh, I've one of those Alexa things. I can just say play RT Morning Ireland, play World Service. So, and I do yeah. listen to a lot of RT as well in the morning. I, I recently, since actually since Brexit, and um, so I listen to a lot of Irish radio and I listen to British radio. And I was really struck, you know, Irish radio for the last week, actually with Trudy, it's what we call you know, the St. The, it's the kind of decade of St. Henry's in Ireland. So this, the, the foundation of Northern Ireland is part of a wider story of Irish independence and Irish statehood. But it's really interesting, the, converse, the, the discussions on Irish radio, there's like a long running series on this on, on Morning Ireland. And as part of it this week, they're talking about partition and the story of partition, you know, Charles Townsend's got a new book out on this is it's really messy. Like partition was so not a logic, you know, partition could easily not have happened but it's mm. so interesting to find out how it did happen why what why the six counties were included and not the nine why the four why it wasn't four counties instead of six you know there's a whole interesting history when it comes to as i've seen in any way the british discussion on the saint henry all you get is a bit about tourism and a bit of bump about you know it's bump there's almost i've heard almost no conversation at a british level about the story of Northern Ireland. How did yeah. Northern Ireland come to be here? Yeah. Um, and I guess what's interesting, and I might bring you in here, Matthew, is to talk about, we're talking about the border. So, you know, the other thing that's interesting to me is coming from, uh, from not a million miles away from the border, but on, 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 on the south side of it is, you know, growing up, we, I, could, I would have found it hard to imagine a time in which we talked about a border poll. You know, and, and it was something that was especially something that was on television. You know, we had this very big iconic debate on RT recently, which... Uh, involving a series of people, including Joe Brawley, uh, quite controversially about Irish Not independence. Not the SDLP, extremely controversial. Yeah, yeah, yes, it, yeah, yeah. Um, and I we was very... there and the SDLP weren't there. <laughs> well, I'm glad you were there, Sarah. But <laughs> so, like, what, what you know? What do you? What, where, where? Like, you know, obviously the SDLP is a position on this, but you know, are we? At, are we going to see? Are we at a point where a border poll is? You know, it's something we're now talking about. Does that mean that something is going to happen? And what do you think would take us to get there? Well, um, I think um, I think arithmetically it would be, and I don't mean arithmetically in a kind of lurid uh, head kind of way. I mean, if you look at the arithmetic of um, what we what we've all been talking about, the, sh the the change, the tensions within the UK state, um, and the number of other variables, it is now significantly more likely than it was in. May 2016, that a border poll will happen um, uh, at some point, I think probably in the next decade, but I'm not making a prediction. I, I'm not making a prediction because I don't think it's a useful, ethical or constructive way to approach these things. Um, and I say that as so someone who represents a party which does have a preference and does believe in um, changing the constitution. Um, and, you know, it's very important that, <laughs> I would say this wouldn't that all of us who have a constitutional preference in Northern Ireland approach these questions with the kind of caution and care that you would expect in a post-conflict society. But in a sense that what I've just said speaks to the challenge that Northern Ireland is facing at the minute, which is that, and I'll come on to how Northern Ireland links in with the rest of these islands and the UK state and how, what that means about, to the Irish state, because this is critical. The Northern Ireland context we live in now, the solution post-1998 was a product of a number of things. And in some ways it was, a, you know, if you took a geopolitical, that you zoom out as far as you can get, it probably wasn't com completely disconnected from the end of the Cold War, from the fact that a US president was able to devote time to put political pressure, uh, to make it a priority that, that, that the Northern Ireland problem was solved. Um, it was also the product of there being two very stable states that were both members of the European Union. One was the UK state, the other was the Irish state. There is a now very live and real possibility that the UK state will not exist in its current form uh, within the next decade. Um, that is was not something that was in any way foreseen in 1998. I think in 1998, the SNP had, there was, first of all, there wasn't a Scottish parliament um, and there were only, um, I think, half a dozen Scottish MPs. It's also worth saying briefly in parenthesis, one of the interesting things about the history of the UK state and these islands is that in a strange way the devolution settlement of 1998-99 in Northern Ireland but also in Scotland and Wales was in a subtle way actually quite good for 
unionism in Northern Ireland in a way that it wasn't necessarily good for unionism in Scotland and Wales. It made Northern Ireland less anomalous for a, for a very brief period, for a relatively brief period in history, for about little less than 20 years, people talked about devolution in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Yes, Northern Ireland had an asterisk because it, because it was post-conflict and because of the Good Friday Agreement. But you someone mentioned earlier on about the fact that you talked about it, Peter, that the 1920s was the first experiment in uh, British devolution in Northern Ireland. That's true, but of course that isn't really internalised into the history of the UK state. Northern Ar devolution in Northern Ireland became a much more normal, less anomalous thing when there was also devolution to Edinburgh and Cardiff. So that's in parenthesis. Um, but the, the point that the UK state is changing fundamentally has changed since Brexit. Um, does mean that it is inevitable that questions around the constitutional status of Northern Ireland will change. Um, not to be narcissistic or uh, sort of a politician about it and talk about it and release to myself, but five years ago, I was a British official working in number 10 Downing Street. I would not have chosen that to do that if I was seriously planning a career as a nationalist politician in Northern Ireland. I'm not that for strategic or farsighted. Um, I wouldn't be here doing this job um, as, a, as an SDLP politician were it not for Brexit and the fundamental reordering that that has meant uh, of the UK state. Um, uh, and we haven't yet seen the outworkings of that. And the thing about Brexit is the entire process has actually, if in a sense it was a question posed to, or cleverly posed by Dominic Cummings and Vote Leave to lots of English voters about their, about anger, concern about where power lies, it has then consistently forced of people in other parts of the UK, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and yes, to an extent, Wales, although possibly in a slightly different way, um, to ask questions about where power lies in the UK state. And that's exposed the extremely rickety and ad hoc and improvised way that the current UK constitution has been created. So yes, it is natural that we ask questions about the future of Northern Ireland in that context. I think as someone who believes in a different constitutional position for Northern Ireland, and um, in the context of removing the international border, it's really important that we frame that debate in the context of the UK changing, because we are going to need a relationship with um, the UK, not just because of Sarah's Britishness, because of because of my relationships in Britain, my connections to, to Britishness in the island of Britain. I lived for 20 years of my life uh, until last year in Britain. So there's that. The final point I want to make in terms of how we approach these questions is, you and I have mentioned this to you before, Peter, but you know, one of the issues there is in, I think, Dublin is sometimes that they would rather that people uh, who would like constitutional change in Northern Ireland, the North, don't talk about it at all. And clearly, I mean, I disagree profoundly with Sinn Féin and their analysis of Irish history and how they approach these questions. But there's, I think, at times a degree of cognitive dissonance about the profound change that is happening in the UK state, but also a belief in Dublin that, um, that we can all simply pretend that it's 1998 again and the UK, the UK state that signed the Good Friday Agreement is the same UK state that exists now and it demonstrably isn't. And if you want to see the evidence that it isn't, um, you have to look at what's happened in the last 24 hours. I think it's unthinkable that any UK government, Labour or Conservative, between the late 19, between the 1990s and maybe a decade ago or even a few years ago, even Theresa May's government, would have done what the UK, what someone did in the last 24 hours in terms of briefing that story about um, the approach to legacy issues. So all of that means that these things are shifting. There are, there's evidence of it everywhere. And I think the important thing, you know, and it is, it's disconcerting and it's discombobulating, particularly for those of us who want to see change in Northern Ireland, not just constitutional change, but deep and profound societal change that addresses these like extraordinarily difficult issues around reconciliation uh, and economic underperformance that we have here and that we do so in a responsible way. But you know what, it is difficult to do it, um, to, to do it as cautiously and carefully as I would like to do it because things are moving so fast in other places. Uh, and, um, uh, and I suppose I'll leave it at that and try and be uncharacteristically concise. Thank you very much, Matthew. I think it says something when you said what's happened in the last 24 hours that I wasn't sure whether you were talking about what seems to have been a briefed legacy, uh, amnesty for legacy uh, of, of everyone from the Troubles, uh, which seems it was briefed last night to Telegraph, or the impending war with France over Jersey. This is, this is quite, which in some ways is emblematic of some of these issues. And I feel like this is a great moment to come to, to Adam and actually kind of bouncing off a, a question here from Rebecca Winnard as well. And Rebecca's asking, you know, um, 
what about after Brexit, the, the, the ignoring of the Sewell Convention, which is the idea that basically Scotland should be able, if Scottish, Scot, the Scottish Parliament has the power to decide on, on Scottish matters first and foremost, and Westminster shouldn't, uh, shouldn't. And the refusal of judicial review lead to more intergovernmental -govern problems in the union, or will it go away? And I guess this speaks, as Matthew talks, the kind of crisis of the British state. And, and you know, I guess the first question I'll ask my, uh, Adam is, uh, you know, just I'll frame it because there seems to be, I, whenever I say this, people do bite back at me. There is no crisis. And it's it's people like me and Adam and people like Anthony Barrett in this call and people like Linda Colley who are, and Richard Wynne Jones, a lot of us actually, who are inventing uh, this crisis of the British state. Really, Britain is a unitary state, like lots of other states. It's just like France, it's just like Germany. And we are we are inventing these problems and the, the solution to this is to retreat back into a unitary vision of the british state what do you think adam um, <laughs> i think i know your answer i think uh, it's a two word a two letter answer to that but yes keep going <laughs> i mean there's a lot to say isn't there i mean i mean you know you only need to look at the election results we're going to see emerging over the next few days to understand that, that that's clearly nonsense but but i also think that there's a whole lack of history here. So, you know, it's not just the 100th anniversary of Northern Ireland this week, it's the 100th anniversary of the United Kingdom of Great Britain in Northern Ireland. You know, the, the state under which I also live is also celebrating, in a sense, its 100th birthday. And, you know, that, that idea of Britishness, you know, Tom Collins puts a very interesting point in the chat where he says, you know, that King George V addressed the first Northern Irish Parliament talking about the newly elected MPs as Irish as we talked about, you know, that that existed in the context of empire. And although I've agreed with almost everything Richard said, the one thing I disagree with is for me, you know, the biggest constitutional change in the British state in the last hundred years was independence for India and the breakup of the empire. And that you can't really understand any of this without seeing that, you know, 40 years ago, or even, you know, 70 years ago, when Britain was first emerging from war, what we had was a kind of new British state that came out of the ashes of empire and the idea of Britishness as we understand it now really only emerges from then. You know, that, that before then you were a citizen of the British Empire. Look at legal framework of citizenship laws. You know, everyone was a British citizen if they lived in a part of the empire, in a colony. And that one of the things I've been really thinking about recently, you know, as I say, I got um, Tom Nairn's breakup of Britain in the post, which in which in the 1970s he predicted the breakup of Britain. And the other book I, I was sent at the same time is a new book that's coming out soon by um, uh, James Marriott and Terry McAllis called Crew Britannia, which is about the history of the oil industry in Britain. And it's a very interesting, you know, if, if you imagine that Britain hadn't discovered oil in the late 1970s, and ask yourself the question, you know, as the empire continued to unfold until about the 1970s, what would happen then if we hadn't discovered, if you know, Britain hadn't discovered oil and been able to inflate the city and the massive financial bubble that sustained the British economy for the next 40 years? How quickly would that process have continued? And obviously, it's a kind of factual, we don't know. But I suspect the answer is much, much faster. In a sense, what we're seeing is a delayed process from the end of empire. I don't mean that in the sense that Scotland is a colony. Scotland, you know, was a very active participant in colonizing rather than being a colony. But the purpose of the union in the first place between the Scottish ruling class, you know, my ancestors, there's a reason I have a Scottish accent, but it's not that I've got Scottish, um, and the English ruling class was to go and conquer the world. And that agreement essentially came to an end sort of over the course of the 20, 30 years after World War II. And then we suddenly struck oil. And so there was a whole nother purpose of being together, which was using that oil money to inflate the kind of financial bubble and the city of London and also the city of Edinburgh, you brought back to Scotland, etc. And I think what we're seeing now, in a sense, is the end of that era. And the big event, you know, really in that was 2008 financial crash, when it became very clear that that wasn't a sustainable settlement anymore. And, you know, in a sense, to answer the question about Brexit, I would trace a lot of this, a lot more of this to the 2008 crash than to Brexit. Yes, absolutely, Brexit is an important point in that process. And all the things everyone said, I agree with. And yes, it's not surprising that in that process, all of those kind of temporary contingent rules around devolution, um, you know, are coming on, are being unraveled. But that devolution settlement was built on that old model of the British state, which relied on, you know, this kind of very, very credit heavy oil inflated economy.
can I jump in there, Peter? Please do. Please jump in, guys. It's not. So, I'm, so I'm not I, the only I'm one. Gonna, I, 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 I mean, Adam makes a, a great point about the India and the retreat from an empire, and, and actually, particularly the emblematic role of India in that. But one of the things I would just like to say about Brexit um, and and how it relates to the the crisis, which I think we are clearly uh, in a in a crisis. The interesting thing, if you can, I mean. Northern Ireland had this whole kind of devolved history, which is, as people um, people have said, was written out of the story of a state, effectively. What's interesting about the past 20 years from Cardiff and Edinburgh is that we've seen a complete transformation. We, we have new political institutions, new political class, uh, new political debates, a civil society has been organised or reorganised, there's been this huge transformation in Scotland and in Wales, which in some ways, you know, ha has echoes in Northern Ireland, right? What's, what's fascinating, in the same period, nothing changed in London. You know, the territorial management of the state didn't change at all. Nothing. <laughs> they kept going with the Wales office and the, the Scottish office and, you know, the select committee and basically nothing changed at the centre. And so in, at, at, around the periphery, we had this debate about the UK, we, you know, we, the, the whole model of parliamentary sovereignty is, hasn't formally gone, but we all know it doesn't mean anything anymore. And we're moving on to a different kind of a politics. And we, we don't know what to call it. Is it asymmetric, quasi-federal? I mean, there were really ugly phrases being framed. But the whole idea was that we knew, right, that things had changed and you couldn't go back. Meanwhile, at the centre, they kept going with all the same ideas, all the same dogmas. What Brexit does is it means that we can't, we, we can't keep telling these stories at the same time. Before Brexit, we could keep going with these completely incommensurable stories, because apart from a couple of Supreme Court cases that you know interested people in Wales, but probably nobody else, like these things never, actually clashed. But because of the way that the UK government then chose to interpret the Brexit mandate, and I think Sarah's absolutely right, it wasn't nailed on that they would pursue this, you know, bugger you the 48% approach to the mandate, okay? But, the, but what it did is it made the, the pretense impossible to maintain. And so we've now got hard sovereignty politics, right? Uh, and, and so this is why I think that Brexit is so profound. I don't disagree with Adam, uh, and I think his political economy is really fascinating. But I, but I think that what Brexit does is it makes the, the kind of pretense that we had in Scotland and Wales and potentially Northern Ireland, all of that goes away. It is actually hardcore, Dicean, parliamentary mm -hmm. supremacy, sod you, we're not going to listen to anything you have to say, no matter how reasonable you are, Welsh Labour unionist government, with your very constructive suggestions, we just don't care, right? Uh, and, and so this is why Brexit is this particular moment, in my view. I, I, as someone who did write, I wrote a piece for Political Europe about two weeks ago called Will Sovereignty Break Up Britain? So I'm very much on your camp on this. And I think it's been very interesting to see. It's been a, a slow burn of people figuring out, like, when you have a maximalist vision of sovereignty like this, you're going to end up. And I think a lot of people in Scotland and even in Wales and, and maybe even in Northern Ireland, they've got ambivalent relationships of where they think sovereignty is. A lot of people, I think, if you ask people on the street here in Glasgow, is the is the Scottish Parliament sovereign? We don't think about that much. Yeah, probably it is. We're not really aware that there's at the back of it is is a, is parliamentary sovereignty outside of outside of the British outside of the English context. Which brings me to like a kind of we've only got a few minutes left, and I guess one of the questions I keep on, and I think it's kind of ran through this, is you know British po English politics could change, but at the moment you know we have elections in England. It looks likely that it'll be probably be a good day for the Conservative Party. They've had a lot of good days recently. They're po still polling very well. Um, it looks as if you know that might change over time, but it still feels as if it's a conservative government in waiting in many respects too. And I wonder, like, you know, how how do this kind of things we're talking about, the kind of conversations we've been talking about, do they start to happen with a conservative government? Or, you know, Sarah, maybe I could get you in from 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 Northern Ireland. Like, 
do we see any chinks of light in terms of of, 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 of a Westminster government that's going to be able to deal with some of these incredibly, in some ways, uh, quite complicated questions around you know not just um not just politics but identity and on lots of other issues i don't i can't say you know i I think as i said i think they've kind of just they've kind of discovered the union exists you know what's kind of there's been there's been a light bulb moment i think it's i think it's with scotland to be honest more than northern ireland there's this realization of oh oh dear something's happening here and if, if if obviously you don't project brexit or the project of brexit that they have that they they have come to that starts to look pretty weak if it leads to the breakup of the union and it's just England on its own or England and Wales together. Um, so I, I I don't see them being able to take the steps necessary to actually protect the union and listen to these type of questions because they're just not capable. Boris Johnson is not capable of um, listening to unionists in Northern Ireland, recognising the different the different types of unionists in Northern Ireland. He's not capable of listening to nationalists and Republicans as well because let's forget they completely ignored that side as well. So no, I, I don't see it. I, I personally just hope that the Tories will, will go, but I don't think that's going to happen for a long time. Um, Adam, just to bring you in on this too, like, is you know where you know, the Scott Boris Johnson said he will not have another referendum on on Scottish independence, and that seems to have, you know technically he doesn't have to have one, and it feels as if that's been internalised by some, um, as if that means it's the right thing to do because politically it might play out quite well in England. But is this you know is this a sustainable approach to a, a, a plural a plurinational union? Well, I think there's two things to say. I mean, the first is that you can't separate all this kind of Anglo-British nationalism from the strength of the Tories. You know, the Tories are the party of Anglo-British nationalism. As Richard very well described in 2015, that's how they got power and why Brexit happened, was by, you know, kind of having a moral panic against the Scottish independence referendum, which happened just a few months earlier. And that's consistently been the case. Every time the Tories are in trouble, in 1983, they go and have the Falklands War and you you wave the Union flag, et cetera, et cetera. You can go through a lot of the last century and basically the way to always win elections is by being the party of the institutions of the British state. And so as long as this crisis is ongoing, which it will be for a long time, it's likely the Tories will continue to kind of manufacture that Anglo-British vote and be able to you know, manufacture kind of moral panics and crises in order to win elections. So we can't separate these things. It's not like you can just sit and wait for a Labour government in England. You know, England isn't going to come to its senses until it, you know, until the crisis stops and the way the crisis will stop, I think is probably a breaking up Britain. Um, you know, it's not, it's not like you can just go back to 1997 and reinflate that asset bubble. Um, but uh, to answer your, your other question, you know, how will, how will the conflict play out? And the answer is, I have no idea. You know, Boris Johnson doesn't want to go on to a referendum and this conflict is very good for him in England. Um, on the other hand, you know, it isn't a sustainable way to run a state. And, um, and you know, what will happen next? Who knows? Wait and see. That um, feels like I've got to butt in there because I've just realised it's all we're almost out of time and um, we could keep on talking until the votes started being counted in Scotland this time tomorrow. It's certainly not an issue that we're stuck for conversation as I thought it would be. I want to say a huge thanks uh, to everybody who's joined us um, on on the, uh, on the Zoom call on the Facebook. Thanks a million for, for joining in. Thanks to an absolutely star-studded excellent panel and my apologies to Matt O'Toole for not giving him a final word. I hope to buy you a pint at some stage yeah. or some dingle or somewhere else. That sounds good. As as, as and uh, yeah, I'm, I am. Please keep an eye out on Open Democracy's website www.opendemocracy.net for more of our live weekly discussions. There'll be more details of this whole. Um, there will be kind of a video of this as well at some stage, I'm sure, on the YouTube channel and all the rest of it. So you can check it out if you've missed it. So thanks a million for everybody's questions. I'm sorry for not getting to all the questions. As you can see, there was, yeah, we same shame so sort. Yeah, an hour whizzes by when you're talking about the breakup of Britain. Uh, thanks a million, everybody. Lovely to see you. Thanks all the rest. Have a lovely evening.